Thank you all for attending today's lecture. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into the greatest conflict in human history. Often referred to as the Waifu Wars. Many modern scholars debate the point of origin of the conflict, with many making claims that the origins are found as far back as the Iliad, some claiming ties to the Mahabharat. What is known for sure, and commonly accepted as a sort of flashpoint of the conflict, is the 1995 work, Neon Genesis Evangelion. The work itself has a history tied to it that uh, you know, we won't go too into depth on here today. But we will be tackling a few key points. Evangelion is a divisive and controversial work. I myself have patented this specific diagram, which dives into the minds of those participating in the conflict with various points of interest and contrasting opinion. To start, for example, a big source of discourse is something I call the Mecca Division. Oh, I will get rid of them with my own hands. Your crime shall not go unpunished. I still have to figure out my true identity. Let's do it. Now, fire! What's happening? This is a conflict between those who would call themselves hardcore, real, obscure, true Mecca fans, and those who claim to enjoy Mecca in the most casual sense. You can probably identify these individuals better by their profile pictures or their usernames on social media and other platforms. With the former having an obscure pilot from an 80s super robot show or some schematics of a robot designed by some random artist. And in the latter, well they probably just have a picture of Yoko Lindner's ass, as to be expected. The debate between the two comes in the form of Evangelion's so-called quality as a Mecca show. Is it a flagship of Mecca? Should it be the face of Mecca shows? Does it represent Mecca well? It, is, it, is it a top ten Mecca? These are the sort of questions you'll commonly find them shooting each other over. The next part of the diagram is those who dive into Evangelion debating allegory and metaphor. I like to call it the Bible division. On one hand, you have those who believe Hideaki Ono and his assistants wrote the series Evangelion, guided by the hands of Buddha and Jesus themselves, while sipping wine from Goblet of Zeus himself on Olympus, with meanings so deep and abstract that a penguin taking a bath deserves a passage in the Quran. Their opposition are those that think Ono and his assistants are batshit insane, they think they're most likely borderline pseudo-intellectuals that, while working with a limited budget and on a psychotic amphetamine binge, they managed to crank out 26 episodes of whatever the fuck that was. The given stances are understandable, knowing the history behind Evangelion. In the early to mid-90s, Anno played his hand a little too open and ran into debt with the Chinese triads. After borrowing money and making a big gamble on early Romanian cryptocurrency, Anno found himself cornered by debt and questions. As a result, he started creating Evangelion. Many tried to disguise the ups and downs of production as depression that was later transferred into the writing of the show. You know, he was depressed while making it. His, him and his assistants had to come together because of depression and personal issues. The cover-up is understandable, as the show was somehow marketed towards kids and teens. The truth is that Anna went from receiving monthly emails, to weekly emails, to daily emails, all reminding him of what various parties were demanding of him. The primary sources we have for these are two connections from the triads and one from the production studio. Anno handled the corporate situation with relative ease, by marketing 14-year-old children, he managed to feed the corporate sharks by granting them the merchandising rights to Evangelion. This not only satisfied their pockets, but it fed their crippling crack cocaine addictions. 
The triad side was a primarily bogged down production on the show, as Anna would often disappear to, quote, handle personal issues, according to his assistants. The likely reality was he was attending meetings with the two primary triad contacts. One, a Chinese man named Li Li, and secondly, an African-American man named Dequarius Lamarius Royce III. I have here two example emails recovered from documents snuck over to me on a Norwegian fishing vessel in 2006. The first reads, Mr. Shen is a very patient man. However, he has informed me that I should remind you of your current stance in the arrangement. He would suggest you will make it your priority to settle matters before his patience runs thin like the silk of a spider. This email was sent by the African American contact. The second email reads, Aw damn player, you best be thinking about getting Shen his cash, homie. My mans needs to shit, but he ain't got no paper to wipe, you feel me, G? Best get a move on before we be bussing caps in that Evangeli ass. This email was sent by the Chinese contact. Anyway, I'm getting too into it. It's time to get back to the topic at hand. These talking points are big, and you may even start thinking about where you fall on the chart and what your own opinions are. However, remember one thing. These conflicts pale in comparison to the one we're looking at today. Raytard, Asakunt, Robot Bitch, Red Haired Bitch. The war that's lasted almost 30 years. Who is best girl, Asuka or Ray? The war has spanned decades and has led many to ruin. It has caused numerous spin-off conflicts and has led to the destruction of countless. Are you into Asuka, the seemingly loudmouth and abrasive girl with repressed and buried psychological issues and doubts? Are you into Rey, the seemingly robotic and distant girl with a lost sense of self-worth and humanity? Just what sort of details do you find that draws you towards one or the other? Is it the suit colors, designs, mecha suits, voice actors, scenes, backstory, psychology, and so forth? As you can see, the war is so layered that it has led to a conflict I fear will be never-ending. The war has carried on for so long, some people have lost faith in the red and blue altogether and have turned to others. Fear the Masato Caliphate. For these people have disillusioned themselves with both the idea that they are above the Ray vs. Asuka war, and that Masato is seemingly the right choice. God help them. Their neutrality is an illusion. They are indeed a viable and dangerous third party in the war, and they are most certainly a rising third faction. Some have retreated into the darkness, far from the light of God, and illuminated only by the war itself. These are the Ritsuko fans. Though their selection is definitely understandable, and their opinions convincing, they simply do not have the backing to make a proper assault, and have seemingly been absorbed or conquered by the Masato faction, as well as the previous Rei and Asuka. There are those that have selected Ibuki Maya, a patrician choice, but a small one at that. This faction is usually carried by the motivation of short hair or the like but they rarely find their way into reports during the conflict. However, ladies and gentlemen, there is a faction that has yet to be talked about, just when you thought it couldn't get worse. Shinji Akari. You may be shaking your head and confused, but what I have to disclose is nothing but the current truth. You're probably sitting there wondering, How is it possible? How can Shinji Akari be best girl? He's a guy. How is it possible? Shinji has been elevated to the rank of femboy. A title so powerful that many have placed him beyond the others as so-called best girl. 
This, this femboy group, is the most dangerous extremist group involved in the conflict, as their numbers grow and grow by the day at a rate that is unknown. Their reasons for this will not be discussed here. As you can see, the waifu war is no laughing matter. Many other series and characters have been dragged into the conflict, but they have been resolved relatively quickly and easily. Unfortunately, so long as the Evangelion War continues, the world will never see peace. 